Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you, and a uh, special welcome to you if you're new or visiting with us. I'd love you to turn to uh, John chapter 4, or keep that part of the Bible open as we look at that together. I wonder if you feel like you're too far gone for God. Is that like a nagging thought that keeps you awake at night or sort of returns like one of those really annoying flies on a hot summer's day? Could God love me even after I've done this? If God only knew what I've been like, the places that I've been, the people I've been with, the things I've said and thought, what do you want anything to do with even someone like me? If you've been following along in John's Gospel up to this point, we've seen and heard Jesus' nighttime interaction with Nicodemus, John chapter 3, and Jesus telling him that he had to be born again if he was going to be part of God's kingdom, God's family. But that was Nicodemus, smart, respected, upright, one of Israel's teachers on the list of who's who. He was in the in crowd So when we hear the words, whoever believes, in John's most famous of verses, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, we wonder, does whoever believes really mean whoever believes? Does that include even someone like me? Or am I too far gone? Even though we don't often think about it like this, in a very real and important way, the question actually has more to do with God and what God's like and what he's done and what he offers rather than what we've been like and what we've done. We tend to think of the issue and ask the question from our perspective and that makes sense to a degree, but putting the focus and emphasis on us only gets us so far and can actually lead us down the wrong track ultimately. If instead we consider what Jesus is like and what Jesus has done, there might just be more hope for us than we first thought. Whoever you are and whatever you've done. And that's what I'm hoping we'll see as we meet Jesus again on the pages of John's Gospel this morning. Before we do that, let's pray and ask for God's help as we look at his word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent your son Jesus into our world, that he lived and died and rose again. Please help us to focus our thoughts, our attention, our hearts and our minds on him as we look at your word together, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John starts his account for us by giving us three important pieces of information before Jesus comes on the scene, three pieces of information that help set the scene for us and help us understand the significance of what Jesus says and does. The first of these is in verse 4. Now he, that is Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. The location's important for us to know because the Jews and the Samaritans, as Susan pointed out really helpfully for us in the kids' spot, they couldn't stand each other. They wouldn't have anything to do with each other. In fact, they hated each other. There were religious differences There were political differences, there were cultural differences, there were racial differences that divided these two groups. John gives us a little glimpse into the situation down in verse 9 where he says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So keep that in mind when we find Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman. The second piece of information is in verse 5 and it's to do with Jacob. This interaction between Jesus and the woman occurs near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And we're also told Jacob's well was there. Jacob, he was one of the key forefathers of the people of Israel. In fact, he got his name changed from Jacob to Israel. 
And it was his 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. So he was an important man and this was an important place. It was a well that he dug out. Along with the land around it, he'd passed that on to his son Joseph as well. So this connection with Jacob is going to become important in the first part of Jesus' interaction with this Samaritan woman. And the third important piece of information is given to us at the end of verse 6. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. John very deliberately lets us know not only the location of this interaction and this conversation, but also the time, the moment that it occurs. It happened at the sixth hour, which if you count from dawn, sun up, six hours takes you through to midday. So this conversation, it happens smack bang in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day, noon, 12 o'clock. And that piece of information is going to become important in the second part of Jesus' conversation with this Samaritan woman. John very deliberately includes these three key pieces of information into his narrative so as to set the scene for us. So with that info in our heads, Samaria, Jacob, the the sixth hour, let's look at and let's listen to what Jesus has to say to this woman from Samaria. Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water... Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. If you knew. Jesus tells the woman that if only she knew two things in particular, their interaction wouldn't have consisted of him asking her for a drink, but rather her asking him. If she knew, one, the gift of God, what's on offer, what God's holding out to her, And two, who it is that's asking for a drink? Who is this man? What is his identity? Let's think about that second piece of knowledge to begin with. Who is this man who asks her for a drink? What is his identity? Verse 11. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? As we considered a little earlier, Jacob was a significant figure. For all of their differences, he was significant to both the Jews and the Samaritans. They at least had that in common. And for the woman, Jesus' offer of living water, although she doesn't understand what he's getting at yet, she does understand that he's saying something about himself, his identity. For her, he's putting himself in the same category. He's putting himself up there. He's making himself out to be even greater than the great forefather Jacob. Not likely, she thinks. And we've got to admit that in a hot, dry, arid place, the gift of water, it's like gold, isn't it? It's a significant, a, a precious gift And that's what Jacob had done. He was the source of that gift. He dug the well and he'd used it himself and he's passed it on to his sons who'd passed it on and passed it on and so it went all the way down to the inhabitants of this Samaritan town and this woman herself. Centuries later for her, this was the gift that had kept giving. So who then is this man? What is his identity? Because even Jacob had to dig to access this water. Jesus doesn't even have a bucket, and yet he's offering living water. If you knew who it is that asks you for a drink, Jesus said. 
Are you greater than our father Jacob? How about that second piece of knowledge that Jesus mentioned to the Samaritan woman? That other piece of knowledge that she was lacking? If you knew the gift of God. Jesus has already referred to the gift as living water, which on the face of it could just mean fresh running water, like you'd find in a stream or a river rather than a well or a pool. Fresh, clean water instead of stale, stagnant water. But have a listen as he goes a little bit deeper in his conversation with the woman and tells her more about this gift of God that she doesn't know about yet. Verse 13. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. As many of you know, my wife Alison lived in Botswana for a number of years when she was growing up between the ages of 8 and 14. Her parents were missionaries there at a Bible college and on occasion they'd head out to visit people on their lands, their uh, property. You can kind of picture the scene, dry, dusty, red dirt, very hot days. And on the lands, you couldn't drink the water. So the people there would offer Alison and her siblings soft drink instead, which sounds like a great treat, doesn't it? Every kid's delight. But of course, when you're hot and thirsty, soft drink, as tasty as it might be, just makes you even thirstier. You long just to have some water. It's a bit like that with the two different kinds of water that Jesus is talking about. The water in the well, as Jesus says to the woman, you're here today to fill up your bucket, but you're going to have to come back tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. But the gift of God that he's talking about, this living water that Jesus gives, whoever drinks that will never thirst. Why is that? Well, it's because even more than Jacob's well was, this truly is a gift that keeps giving, isn't it? It becomes a spring of water, welling up, resulting in eternal life. As John will tell us later in chapter 7, Jesus is talking about the gift of the Spirit, God's very presence with us, enabling us to know and enjoy God now, and a deposit guaranteeing the full experience of that in the time to come. Jesus' words here link really well with Jeremiah's words. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. This is what God says to his people through Jeremiah. It's up on the screen for you as well. Jeremiah says, well, God says through Jeremiah, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. Doesn't that describe each one of us? What we've all been like at one time or another? We've forsaken, we've rejected, we've turned away from God, first sin, and second sin, we've tried to live life our own way. We've tried to bring meaning and purpose and satisfaction and joy into our lives apart from God. Instead of being in relationship with the one who is the spring of living water, we've gone our own way, digging our own cisterns that at the end of the day don't work because they're broken and they don't hold water. I wonder in what ways have you done that? Forgetting, rejecting, missing who Jesus is, his identity, God with us, the word made flesh, the spring of living water, and instead turn to other things, other relationships perhaps, wealth and possessions, social status, career, Success, the next holiday. What is Jesus saying to us this morning? Everyone who drinks this water 
will be thirsty again. But if we know who it is who is asking this woman for a drink, his identity, and if we know the gift of God, what's on offer, we will be the ones asking him for the water he gives and he will give us living water and will never thirst because that water becomes a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It is the gift of God himself, the Spirit with us now, changing our present reality and guaranteeing the fullness of what's to come. The woman, understandably, in many ways, is still struggling to understand what Jesus is talking about, isn't she? She doesn't get what he's saying. She shows in her response that she doesn't yet know him and she doesn't yet know the gift of God that he's offering. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And it's at that point that the conversation gets rather interesting, doesn't it? It seemed to be heading in one direction and then kind of seems to veer in a different direction altogether. Verse 16, it's an abrupt change, isn't it? But as we'll see, it's not as disconnected from what's been going on as we might first think. No doubt there are a number of different possible reasons for why this happens, but one that makes a lot of sense is that as well as misunderstanding who Jesus is and what Jesus offers, the woman hasn't yet understood her own need. She hasn't really understood why it is that she's still thirsty. I wonder if you've had that experience in talking with people. You can be having this conversation about who Jesus is and, and what he's done and what he offers, but if the other person doesn't understand why they need Jesus what their need is, well, who Jesus is and what he's offered doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, does it? Perhaps that's where you're at yourself, even this morning. You haven't yet realised and acknowledged your need. And that's what Jesus draws out in this next part of his conversation with this Samaritan woman. Verse 16... He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. more than we'd realised before, but clearly not more than Jesus already knew. Remember the end of chapter 2? He knows what's in a person. This woman has lived out her own real-life love tragedy, hasn't she? She's found herself on the wrong side of love. She has drunk deeply from the well of love and has come up empty and dry. She'd already had five husbands... Perhaps they could have died, but more likely they divorced her. And now she'd hooked up with yet another man. It seems that she's got to the point where she'll live with anyone who'll have her. Even someone who won't do her the dignity of putting a ring on it. Hers is a sad, sad tale. And now we know why John had told us that third key piece of information back at the beginning. About this conversation taking place at the sixth hour, midday. Now we know what this woman was doing here at the well at that time of day. Because her runabouts with the men had put her on the outer with the women as well. Because if you had to fetch water, wouldn't you go early in the morning or later in the day when the sun wasn't so hot? Wouldn't you normally go and enjoy the social interaction, the, make it a bit of a social thing with the other women? Unless, of course, the glares from condemning eyes stung more than the sun's bright rays. Unless, of course, the whispers of insult hurt more than the sun's scorching heat. 
And here, in her guilt and her shame, this woman who's been on the wrong side of love, this woman who's invested her life in love and has become bankrupt, here she meets one who offers her a love like no other. He knows all about her. He knows what she's done. He knows how she's been living. And yet he extends his love to her. Although she doesn't understand it just yet, she is setting her eyes on the greatest lover she could ever hope to know. That's some love, isn't it? A love that knows everything about you and yet still loves you. So often we keep things from others, don't we? We, we hide things from others because we're worried about what they'll think of us, how they'll react. Can you imagine a love that knew everything about you and yet loved you just the same? I was reading an article the other day about how leading up to Valentine's Day this year, a Canberra business owner invited his social media followers to sit, share their secret crush story to win a dream date. In just 24 hours, he received more than 800 emailed confessions and a further 2,000 on Instagram. And it kept going after the February 14 cutoff date. Apparently, he's received thousands since. As the eventual winner shared, I felt strangely safe and supported through an Instagram account I didn't even know. But how safe and supported would we feel? How, how willing would we be to share if rather than being anonymous, it was all out in the open for everyone to see? The same article quoted research that found that the average person keeps 13 secrets, five of which have never been shared with anyone. What if there was a love that knew everything about you and yet loved you just the same? This Samaritan woman's found it, hasn't she? <laughs> it's being offered by the man who is sitting across from her at the well. That's what he's offering, but again, who is this man? <laughs> what is his identity that he should offer such a thing? Well, that's what this woman is wondering about once more, isn't she? Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship in spirit and truth. She had uh, doubtfully and dubiously asked earlier, are you greater than our father Jacob? Now, because of his knowledge of her past history and of her current home life, she acknowledges him as a prophet. She's getting warmer, isn't she? And so given he's a prophet, she raises the religious controversy of the day. Her people, the Samaritans, worshipped God on a mountain near her place, Mount Gerizim. But the Jews said that God had to be worshipped in Jerusalem, and that's where they built their temple. So Jesus, prophet, who's right? And although she doesn't really understand the enormity of what she's asking, and although, as Jesus points out, there are things here again that she doesn't know, she's struck upon a key question, hasn't she? A key topic. Because what we understand life to be all about influences what we worship. What we think life revolves around, that's what we ultimately set our affections on, what we adore. That becomes our object of worship. It's not whether we're going to worship or not, because we all worship someone or something. It's what or who we're worshipping. 
You see, if you think life's all about love, like this woman had, what will you adore, set your affections on worship? Relationship. If you think life's all about intellect, intelligence, what will you adore, set your affections on and worship? Knowledge. Study. If you think life can be summed up by he who dies with the most toys wins, what will you adore and set your heart on and worship? Well, money. Possessions. Yes, Jesus tells the woman, the Jews had it right, the Samaritans had it wrong in terms of where to worship. But with his coming, with his entrance onto the scene, that was all changing. Worship, it wasn't going to be about where, it was going to be about how and who. True worshippers, Jesus says, worship the Father in spirit and truth. Which on the one hand brings a very real freedom Because God can be worshipped all the time, in all places, by people from anywhere. It's no longer restricted to a particular place or to a particular people group. On the other hand, true worship is also led and guided by the way that God has revealed himself, as he has prescribed according to his truth. Ultimately, it's all about the person speaking these words, the one who will say he is the way, the truth and the life. All people everywhere are to give God the worship he seeks, spirit and truth worship. And it all centres on, it all focuses on Jesus. Which is the note that sounds at the end of this part of the narrative as it reaches its climactic moment. We're going to return after Easter and hear a little bit more about this woman and the effect that her story has on others. But for now, this is the climactic moment of this part of the story. Verse 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Turns out he really is greater than Jacob, isn't he? And he's a whole lot more than just a prophet as well. As the Christ, the Messiah, that is God's long-awaited promised king, Jesus is the one who can offer God's gift of living water. As the one who will stand up again on the other side of death, risen on the third day, he is the one who is able to give the gift of God's Spirit, who can dispense the very presence of God that wells up to eternal life. And as the Christ, the Messiah, God's King, the one who died to take the penalty for our sin of forsaking God, Jesus is the one around whom true worship is centred. Spirit and truth worship, the kind of worship the Father seeks, it's all about him because he is the Christ, the King. And if that is who Jesus is, and if that is what Jesus offers, even to someone like this Samaritan woman, then no one is too far gone. He's gone to his death. <laughs> And he's risen again to make sure of it, hasn't he? Have you asked Jesus for the water he offers? Are you giving God the worship that he seeks? If Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus showed that no one can be good enough for God that everyone needs to be born again, born from above, no matter how upright or respected they might be, no matter how good they might have been, Jesus' conversation with this Samaritan woman shows us that no one can be bad enough for God. (laughs) No one is too bad, too far gone. Because it's got more to do with Jesus and what he's like, with what he's done and what he offers 
than about what you're like and what you might have done. Have you asked him for the water that he offers? Are you giving God the worship that he seeks? How about we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for who Jesus is, greater than Jacob, more than a prophet, demonstrating by his death and resurrection that he is the Christ, the Messiah, your promised King. We're sorry for the ways in which we've tried to quench our thirst by turning to other things in life. We're sorry for the ways in which we've engaged in false worship. We thank you that because of Jesus, none of us is too far gone for you. So we ask that you might work in us to ask him for the water that he offers. And may we give you the worship that you seek. Amen.